Hi everyone, thank you for joining today's webinar presentation, AIA Best Practices, a holistic approach to patent prep and prosecution. I'm Gail Martin, Associate Marketing Manager at LexisNexis IP, and I wanna cover a couple things before we get started. Please feel free to submit your questions on the panel using the Q&A feature. Also, you can download a copy of the slides from today's presentation in the panel. A link to the recording and the presentation will also be sent to you. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Jean Quinn. Jean is the founder of IP Watchdog, a patent attorney, law professor, and leading commentator on patent law and innovation policy. Jean was recently named one of the world's leading IP strategists by IAM Magazine. John White. John White is a US patent attorney and patent lecturer widely regarded as a leading authority on patent practice and procedure. He's an adjunct law professor at the University of Virginia School of Law and the principal lecturer author of the PLI Patent Bar Review course, a course that he originally created. Since 1995, John has personally taught close to 50% of all practicing patent attorneys and patent agents, as well as patent agents, how to successfully become admitted to the patent bar. He has also taught the law and evidence course to numerous US patent examiners. Mike Huddleston. Mike Huddleston is the director of IP product planning at LexisNexis IP. He holds bachelor and master's degrees from Indiana University and a JD degree from the University of California. Thank you again, everyone, for attending today's presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Gene. Thanks a lot, Gail, and thank you all for spending a <clears throat> portion of your Thursday with us, wherever you may be. And as Gail mentioned, you can get the slides if you would like them right now by clicking on the handouts tab and then downloading them. You all get access to them in an email sent to you after the webinar along with a recording. And those of you who are listening to this in a lunch and learn or in a law school classroom, uh, whoever it was that registered will be the person who gets the access uh, to the slides and to the webinar, but please feel free to share those with, with others who are in, in attendance in your lunch and learn group. Um, and if you were interested in this uh, webinar, you probably might want to take a look at one of our previous webinars that we did just recently about tips for avoiding and arguing 112 rejections. I, I suspect at some point today, we will talk a little bit about 112. It's not the focus of this particular webinar, although there is, as you probably all are aware, a renewed emphasis on 112 in the disclosure, and uh, that webinar might be of, of interest. And then allow me just to plug this. This is a, a big event for us. Um, I know many of you do submit these CLEs for, or these webinars for CLE credit in the states where you are admitted. This is one that we have gone and been approved in Virginia for CLE. And Virginia is one of the jurisdictions that is a more strict jurisdiction and accordingly is uh, given reciprocity in many states across the country, including California, Texas, Florida, and others, uh, New York as well. And we have Commissioner Drew Hirschfeld joining us. And this is the fifth anniversary of Alice is coming up and we're gonna talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly what the patent office is doing, is it working? And so mark your calendars, June 20th. Uh, so please join us for that if you can. So uh, we got a lot of people joining us already. More will be joining us, I'm sure, as we move forward. But let's get started with the substance of the program here today, if we can. I'm gonna pause here on our outline page. You've all seen this. I don't need to go through this with you. This was the registration text that you saw on the page where you, you signed up for this webinar today. Um, the AIA changed changed everything really. And, and sometimes in ways we envisioned and sometimes in ways that we really did not envision. And one of the things we're gonna talk about today I, specifically is the, the importance of provisionals and then the uh, changing philosophy of when to search in the depth of search and how quickly you need to get a, a priority date. And uh, that really has changed. And for reasons I can't explain, it seems as if the industry has not really caught up to best practices. And that's the focus of today's webinar. So with that, what I'd like to do is bring on our panelists. 
and uh, start with a very open-ended question to prime the well. So, uh, John, I'm going to start with you, and Mike, I'd like to ask you the same question after John speaks. What is it that you would like folks in the audience here today to have in mind as we approach this topic? The overarching message that I have for people is speed. <laughs> and what I mean is you don't have the luxury of time that we did before the AIA. We need to get the filing date and the filing date has to be fixed and formidable. That is, you have to have everything there that's going to support what you do thereafter. And to do that and do that effectively, uh, there are some tools out there that can help you do it, but it's got to be a philosophical thing that speed is a part of how you practice now to get that first filing date. Okay, thanks, John. Now, Mike, uh, I think you are going to talk to us a little bit about searching, and that and that has changed over over the years. Um, but what what are your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Gene. My thoughts are that uh, with the world we are in today that search becomes uh, what I'd say almost a multi-step process where initially, and following on from what John said, uh, from a speed perspective, you might, wanna, you might wanna do a quick and dirty search to get a, a, a quick handle on the state of the art for purposes of filing and getting a provisional, and then coming back later to do a more deeper dive uh, where you may be looking at novelty in more depth at that point, and that, you know, the search tools can be used to accomplish both of those. Uh, you know, I think uh, probably in the past, um, there were times where you might just do your deeper dive at the beginning, but with the speed issues in a first to file environment, um, doing, a, doing a quick search, taking a look, seeing if it looks clear enough to go and get your provisional uh, can be the starting point, And then you can always come back later to do a deeper dive. Yeah, I think that, you know, those are the best practices today. And um, so now, I mean, let's just jump right into it. And and obviously, if anybody has any, well, I shouldn't say obviously, because I, I don't know how many of you have joined us for webinars previously. But if anybody has any questions as we go along the way, please feel free to shoot us your questions. I will try and weave in as many questions as I can as we go along. And if there is not an a appropriate time to weave them into our conversation. We will save some time at the end to address as many as we can. So gentlemen, let's jump into the substance of the slides. Um, the importance of provisionals. Uh, John, I've been a supporter of provisionals for a very long time, and a lot of attorneys have always told me that, you know, you just can't do a provisional because a provisional has to be as complete as a non-provisional, which is, you know, technically true. But I think that ignores the reality that intervention takes place in uh, in series. It doesn't happen in a in a moment where an inventor just suddenly hits his head on a sink in a bathroom and wakes up and has drawn the flux capacitor and has created a time machine. You know, it's just not the reality of invention. That's Hollywood. Uh, right. And uh, the reality of inventing is it 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 comes when it comes and you get what you get. The, the problem uh, with it is uh, people also disclose. And so a provisional, you know, started way back uh, in 95, was intended to be a specification in drawings just like any other application. The thing that it lacked was claims. But that um, sort of preferred provisional with uh, all kinds of disclosure in it, it quickly became the exception as people realized that you need to get a cover sheet on something and get it filed because you need to win that race to the patent office. And so even before the AIA, we had this thing called the cover sheet provisional where you'd have a cover sheet on, you know, a peer review publication, a uh, uh, specification sheet, <coughs> a set of PowerPoints or something like that. And so it just was what it was. And then you'd circle back and try to write a more complete provisional and then rely on both when the later non-provisional was filed. Well, I'm not advocating cover sheet provisionals, but what I am advocating is we've changed now. We went from obviously first to invent to first to file. 
but first to file is is uh, far more profound than just first to file. It, you know, if you really want your provisional date to stick, you have to put all the clay there that you're going to eventually get to work with to create the sculpture of your claims and and everything else. So give yourself a lot of clay, and uh, <laughs> you know, the, the way to help accomplish that is with searching to get uh, a feel for what the necessary threshold of disclosure is for a particular area of technology and even uh, incorporate by reference on your way through that door, you know, just because uh, it's better to have more than less. You can always take a coat off that you're wearing as opposed to put one on that you don't have. You know, that's what your mother always told you when you left the house. And it's true here too. Yeah. You know, now one of the things that I don't understand is, you know, the last bullet here is, is if you look at the number of provisionals that have been filed, the, it just seems as if the industry is really not adopting this strategy of uh, file early and often, or at least not nearly as much as you would have thought in a first to file world. Now, part of that may be simply that corporate clients were already engaging in best practices, um, but I think there, I, I think that there are a lot of folks that are just to some extent not understanding what it really means to have changed to a first to file system. And the best example that I can come up with here is one that um, former patent, longtime patent commissioner, Nick Adichie, and then he was acting director for a while between the uh, Clinton administration and the Bush administration for a year. Uh, he, in trying to explain just how fragile this grace period is under the AIA, came up with this Velcro jacket example. John, do you wanna talk about this and, and why people should really think about this and why this may be relevant to why you need to get a filing date as early as possible? Yeah, the the reason uh, that we emphasize this is people focus on and and used to focus on the the unique nature of the U.S. patent system uh, because we have this grace period and and we did okay note the word I used did <laughs> because people mistakenly believe that this grace period has spilled over uh, with the AIA. It has, but in an extremely limited sense. The thing that you can count on eliminating as prior art is whatever you've disclosed, either directly or indirectly. So if you made a sale, if you made a disclosure, or if your grad student or salesperson made a disclosure or sale, okay, you have a mark in time, that's a bar date for purposes of your own disclosure. But what you are unaware of are the disclosures of others that will occur within that year. You, you just don't know what they are. You don't know what they might include. And depending on what it is that is disclosed, you may have uh, a useful uh, grace period or you may be completely undone. And so the story that illustrates this best is the, is the jacket that Somebody comes up with uh, a jacket and it has a Velcro uh, closure, you know, where the uh, zipper is. And then another inventor, unknown to inventor A, comes up with a jacket that in this instance doesn't use Velcro, but uses snaps, okay? And so you go, well, I've, I've got them beat with respect to um, at least the closure. And you do. But I suspect that you didn't mean to just invent a closure for a jacket. You intended a jacket with that closure. And the problem is what will be taken from you by virtue of somebody else's disclosure uh, is far, far more than you think. And you'll be left with the differences between what you previously disclo disclosed and what they later disclosed. And everything they later disclosed is prior art, except for what is in common with yours. And so, yeah, in this instance where you came up with the Velcro first closing a jacket, somebody else comes up with snaps, you you, you get the Velcro, well done, but you don't get the jacket, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and that's what you wanted. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, and to put this into the terms of how the Patent Office described this in the Federal Register Notice when they uh, were interpreting the AIA, if you go back and look at that, 
um, the way that they described it was if an inventor, you invent X and Y, and then the intervening disclosure is X, Y, and Z. And they said at least Z is going to be prior art because it's different. Um, and that's where this comes from. So the differences are going to be prior art. Now, the real scary thing here is the last bullet point is the patent office hasn't told us how close it has to be. You know, um, what they've told us is it doesn't need to be identical in order to be removed. But in other places, they have said it needs to be the same. So how close does it need to be to be removed? Those questions are still largely unanswered, and the case law is going to need to decide that. And the problem there is, is, as we all know, there's that old law professor adage, um, at least from the law professors who actually practice, it would tell you, you never want one of your clients to have a case in a case book, you know, because what that means is they spend a lot of money to answer the question for other people. And there's going to be clients that are going to be answering this question for us over the next five years or 10 years. How close is close enough to remove? And um, so the best practice is file early and often, and we don't necessarily see that. Now, John, we do have a question here. Um, and we are seeing some, and I've written an article about this, and we've had conversations about this. There's a Walmart patent that I know of in the uh, autonomous driving space, and it's autonomous collection of shopping carts. And they claimed priority to 39 provisional applications along the way. So this question says, can you touch on the filing of multiple provisionals during your year? Um, what are the risks and rewards of that approach? Well, uh, Gene, the example that you had there of, uh, and, and, you know, this is uh, an area that um, everybody is working on, I suppose, uh, the autonomous driving and the and a shopping cart is a remarkably expensive device. <laughs> and if you can keep track of and retrieve them uh, in an autonomous fashion, you're, you're well ahead of a lot. Uh, of stores out there. And so this was a, an area that was vital, uh, I guess, to Walmart. And so as they were developing it, they just kept throwing things through the door. And so that's probably a, a reasonable strategy for that sort of subject in that sort of context where it's vital and you're spending a lot of money on it, protect it every step of the way and turn back and whatever provisional is still within a year, when you file your non-provisional, you can go ahead and claim the benefit of it. Now, this may fracture your filing date a bit, obviously, uh, because you can be disconnected from some, but not all of your provisionals. But hey, something is better than nothing. Uh, so it's kind of like a non-provisional uh, that's almost treated as a CIP. Depending on what you're claiming, it's going to have a different benefit date. But uh, you know that can get awkward, uh, you know, as you rely on those provisional filing dates. But again, something is better than nothing. But the more typical scenario is you have one, two, or three provisionals, and uh, you uh, pull them together uh, in a later filed non-provisional. That's far more typical, and we've seen that if you've had any inbound foreign uh, work, oftentimes a, U a single U.S. case will claim the benefit of uh, one, two, or three first filed foreign applications, so that's not unusual. Okay, we got another question. So I'm trying to find that site that I mentioned. I'll see if I can locate that and, and get that to folks. But um, in the meantime, let's jump to the next uh, slide here um, regarding patent searching. Um, John, can you lead with this slide and then we'll bring Mike into the conversation as as well? Uh, sure. And, and you know, patent searching is something that uh, I guess is near and dear to my existence because that's how I got started uh, in the field after I was a patent examiner. I uh, left the PTO, went out to start my own practice with a brief sojourn at uh, what was then uh, Cushman Darby Cushman. And as a young uh, practitioner, the work I could get and get fairly readily was searching. So I, I know a lot about searching the philosophies behind it, what people are looking for, and, and uh, that sort of thing. And the thing about searching is, 
when to do it and how to do it have changed tremendously uh, with respect to the AIA. And and in one part, it's the law. In the other part, it's it's just the reality of, of the technical age we live in. And that's the portion that Mike uh, will usefully address. But in terms of timing, it goes like this. Once upon a time, uh, it, you know, you had to determine uh, a justification to file an application, and in part, that turned on novelty. And so, we would do novelty searches all the time. That was probably a third of the work uh, that we did when I uh, owned and ran uh, what was then called Wolcott and Company here in the United States. And uh, you know, you do it pre-filing, and that's because your date of invention was uh, your date of invention, and then you'd file and you know, everybody was was okay, it gave you guidance, how to write the claims and all that. But then when we went to first to file, um, there's some concern that if an inventor comes to you with a um, an invention and you don't, within a week, get something on file at the USPTO, it may be that somebody else beats them to that uh, or not, as the case may be, but depending, if someone does, have you committed some malpractice event by virtue of your delay just because of your typical practices. And so now the key is search, but search to determine sufficiency of disclosure. What is the USPTO accepting now in terms of disclosure on this topic? And as a practitioner, you know, you might have the luxury of working in just a slice of technology, but odds are people come to you with all kinds of things. You know, one day it's a it's a food processor and the next day uh, it's bioinformatics. Well, you know, you, you have to be competent across the board and the way to, to quickly come up to speed is to do a search and determine what's the PTO allowing now, what's the threshold of disclosure necessary and use that to communicate with your client. This is what I need from you in order to put this application together. That's quick, it's efficient, and uh, you're relying on things that have been vetted by examiners. I would tend to rely on patents, not obviously published applications. But the other thing, and this is where uh, Mike can jump in and tell us, I, I was before we started today, I was saying, yeah, when I uh, left the patent office or not long after, maybe uh, three, four years, patent 5 million came out. And you know, we just went past patent 10 million, and that's the United States alone. And by now, every peer review publication across the planet is available to you. Every, everything. How do you make sense of this in a reasonable time frame at a reasonable cost? Uh, how do you wrap your arms around it? And so, uh, Mike, I would I would pitch it to you. Yeah, thanks, John. And uh, that's right. In, in the past, there were there's what I would call there was a universe of in the abstract. Um, theoretical prior art that was out there, but it wasn't really discoverable. But between uh, what we've seen over the last 20 years ago in terms of search technology, machine translation, and data storage capacity, um, a, a, a exponentially increasing number of patents from all over the world are actually available at someone's fingertips. And so then that brings up the issue of, is it if it's available, um, it, you know, what is your scope of duty to uh, search that to see what is out there? And so what search tools have done at this point is, is bring that to the desktop of attorneys so that they can quickly do uh, what you're talking about there to see, okay, um, what does the lay of the land look like in terms of just being able to initially, like I said earlier, um, do do a quick and dirty search, take a look, and see, okay, am I clear enough to go file the provisional um, and get that done? Then those same search tools can also be used down the line if you want to come back and do a deeper dive into, uh, into novelty. Um, so the, the, the world has really changed in terms of searching really due to the scope of data that's available that without advanced search tools, quickly becomes white noise. Um, so the, the, the tools are now available to kind of sift through that white noise. And it's, uh, and as we were talking earlier, it's only going to get worse. There are more and more filings. Um, uh, I know we are updating our content constantly um, 
uh, on a daily basis with what's uh, with what's happening in the world. Um, so the challenge is keeping up with that. So that's what that's what I would add on that point. Yeah, I mean, philosophies has, have changed. I think if you have not given consideration as to whether what you were doing before the AIA is what you should be doing after the AIA, I think you are not doing um, yourself or your client's service. Now, that's not to say that you would come to a different conclusion necessarily, um, because to some extent, we don't know, I think, right? I mean, a lot of these cases and questions are still out there. And the, with searching, there is always um, been and always probably will be different philosophies uh you know and i'm starting to stutter a little bit because there's there's to some extent no definitive right answer i think that there are um better approaches and i think that that's one of the things we're going to talk about here next is to try and maybe give you some some food for thought as to what you could be doing both yourself and what your clients could be doing um so mike why don't we just go right to the to the next slide and then you'll tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here sure thanks gene and this is uh we've got a couple screenshots here from our uh patent searching platform total patent one and um this is for example if you're looking if you want to do a quick search you want to do it in a technology area you're working in the same classes uh on a regular basis uh you can do a quick um class, subclass, restricted search uh, across, we've got 107 authorities around the world and we translate everything into English. So you can you can narrow the scope down to just searching US to broaden it out to searching the world. Um, so, uh, and then you can use tools like this that can allow you to just quickly hone in. Like I said, if you wanted to just uh, do it from a class perspective uh, to take a look uh, within an area, you can do that. Um, so if, if you uh, if you want to go to the uh, to the next slide, uh, or if there was any comments there, yeah, I'll show you this. This is this is one of the things that we do to enable just some quick review. Uh, this is something uh, that we call our dynamic grid view. This is a screenshot of that. You can actually put on the screen uh, anywhere from uh, you know one by one to five by five, which would be 25 uh, documents at the same time. And what we do is we'll put up there the uh, title, abstract, and clipped image if available. Uh, and it's a way, depending, and of course, depending upon the area of art you're in, that's gonna be uh, more relevant than in some than in others, but it enables you to just quickly page through and say, okay, is there anything here that looks like there's a red flag, uh, or am I good to go, uh, at least to make that race to get the provisional. Um, uh, I think we have one more. Um, we go to, uh, the next one. Uh, this is something else that we do, and this is part of what we do in the back end with our with our search uh, search processing uh, engine, uh, which is a similar document to you. So what we do is when you pull a, a patent up and you're scrolling through the text of the patent, there's a section in there called similar documents. Uh, and what this does is we'll give you the top 10 matches. It's essentially doing a search within a search where we will look at the title and abstract, uh, we look at what other patents out there is the language very similar to your patent. We do filter out um, family members because we don't uh, we don't want that noise introduced in here. Because what you're really looking for is what are similar documents out there that are not part of a particular family that I might want to see. Okay, are these going to be a problem, or do, do things look uh, clear enough uh, again to go and and file? So uh, we have a comment here that I want to I want to bring up here now, and it, I'm gonna I'm gonna read it. Um, it says, if the client has advanced inventing staff, then they may already know the novelty over the prior art. If the client has or is a small company, then some research is necessary, really, to ensure that they include enough points of novelty in the provisional, particularly those things that the attorney may not be aware of. Now. Um, Mike, one one of the things that we were talking about during our prep for this is you have um, 
a large Fortune 500, really probably a Fortune 100 company that uses this total patent one with uh, their engineers and scientists as, as well, right? Yeah, correct. So um, we, we have a, a, I was thinking of one client that we had talked about where um, they have an enterprise license to it and everybody from uh, their research, their research staff to their engineers at the bench can use the tool. They all use it in different ways. Um, some would do a, a quick and dirty search at the bench to just see what things look like. Others are going to be doing more involved research before filing the application. Um, so there's a wide variety that it can be used for. It. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it is largely correct to say that the more sophisticated the company, the more likely that the engineers already know uh, the prior art. Although, uh, and this really pushes John into the into the next slide, is, is um, John and I, we've, and this is to some extent, the genesis of this webinar is really this slide and, and a lot of the advice and things that we've talked about are things that um, we have, have kind of led up to this slide in particular and this is where we're going to spend a number of um, minutes uh, probably the rest of the webinar and maybe we'll jump back to some of the other points as well but John and I have been contacted by uh, several companies recently to come in and talk to their engineers, their PhDs, their researchers, to educate them on the patent system, educate them about how to draft better patents, and even in one case, to educate them on how to better uh, participate in the prosecution and uh, even provide first draft responses to office actions. Um, because who knows the inventor invention best? Uh, it's the inventor. And what uh, this one company in particular wanted to make their PhD researchers uh, better inventors. And they are filing, what was it, John? Something like 10 or 12 provisionals a week. A week. A week. Yeah. And uh, seeing what sticks, really. And um, and I think that that really is a best practice. And if, if you're a, a corporation and you're not doing that, I think you have, need to think, well, why aren't you doing that? And this slide, one of the things is, is, as we all know, is a lot of corporate cultures have developed to see the inventors, whether they're engineers or scientists, as only inventors and not as playing a meaningful role in participating in the obtaining of a patent, which just as always as a patent attorney struck me as odd, uh, not odd. I mean, it's beyond odd. You know, it's just it's bizarre because a lot of these companies, what they what they have is uh, only debt. The only things that, that you can point to that are are physical are debt. You know, they have uh, a, a building that they own or that they rent, which is uh, negative on their spreadsheet. They have to pay a lot of people, which is a negative on their spreadsheet. And the only positives that they wind up owning are things that are depreciating extraordinarily fast, like computers or office equipment, and then the patents that they own, which they can fit into a file folder, right? So the patents are what the company is valued based on, the technology. And yet the company, for some reason, doesn't see value in having a culture that has the inventors participate in a meaningful way with the patent attorneys and that just to me has never made any sense so now what we're seeing is is particularly in this first to file world the message has gotten through to the smaller entities to the individuals for sure they got it and but into the entrepreneurs the startups and now not only those folks that are entrepreneurs and startups those folks that were entrepreneurs and startups back in 2011, 2012, 2013, that are still in business in 2019, are meaningful companies doing maybe 50, 100 million dollars worth of business, are real serious players, but yet they are working as if they are still that startup individual based on we've got to file early and we've got to file often. So if you're a larger company and you're not doing that, you're going to eventually, as this patent system turns itself around, you're going to have your lunch eaten. I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, John, thoughts on that? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, things, um, it, well, you know, to give you some context, um, patenting, uh, it, it's a cultural thing. And it this culture comes from the top. And so you have to have leadership, and this could be at a university, it could be at a company. Uh, it, it, it's got to be one that, you know, the future is created by what we're doing today. And if we want to be a part of that future, we have to participate today to get our seat at the table for what's coming. And and a lot of companies, they, they struggle with this. And for a while after KSR, this was uh, the rather big uh, obviousness case uh, decided by now about a decade and a half ago. But people said, oh, no, I don't want to do any searching. I don't want any patents anywhere because it might contaminate me with respect to what I have to disclose and to the extent I disclose it, it will lead uh, the examiner exactly uh, to what I've invented because, uh, you know, it's all going to be obvious and so forth. There were these crazy philosophies out there about uh, how much information you should or should not get from patents and so forth. Well, uh, speaking to this company that uh, Gene and I have done some teaching at, their uh, entire business model is built around having patents and having very strong patents, meaning they have to be the best uh, possibly written patents. And so we're training the inventors and those who liaise with them what the patent system requires, when it requires it, when are the best times to do this. And so they're the, the ambient level of patent savvy at the organization is as high as it can be made. And uh, of course, leadership, the, the, the person who founded and uh, still runs the company is an inventor. And so he, <laughs> he understands more than anybody just how vital this is to the company now into the company in the future. And uh, all right, that's one extreme. But it shouldn't be. <laughs> you know? yeah. No, it really shouldn't be. Um, so, um, Mike, I mean, one one of the things uh, that we talked about during our prep was just how quickly the engineers might be able to go through and do a quick search, because you know, particularly like take this situation where it's a startup company or a smaller company. Um, and they're trying to get into maybe a space where they're they're not an expert because you know we see that a lot right you know you see that they they stumble upon a, a very cool innovation and then somebody says you know this might have applicability over here in this other space well they're not experts in that other space um what what do you suppose i mean how long does it take an, an engineer to to do a say like a 50 60 percent confidence search to just get an idea Sure, they can they can literally do that in minutes um, uh, with with what's available today in terms of being able to either go more broad, uh, narrow their scope, like I showed earlier with class. Uh, one of the things we're going to be um, adding to the product later this year is a transparent um, semantic search capability where they could literally, if they've got a patent that they think is uh, you know, potentially very uh, relevant on all fours. They can just take claim language, dump it in. The query can, will be constructed for them. They can uh, adjust the query right on the screen um, uh, and the relative weights of it and execute it all, all within a couple minutes and then get the results back and, and quickly see, you know, where, uh, uh, where the key concepts are and if things look to be on point uh, or not. Um, so the, the, the tools are, are out there to try to keep up with what the need is. I think, you know, it's interesting in, in listening to both you and John talk the, the, as you were talking about how the need for people's strategy to change is there. You, you are not seeing so much. There's a lagging effect of them actually changing their strategy, but the tools are there to meet the need for that changing strategy. It just needs to be utilized. That's all. Yeah, um, I, I I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I think that you know there's a lot of tools out there that make these things a lot easier to do. And you know, one of the questions that has has come in, and it's from somebody who's saying that you know he's not saying that this is the the right approach, but it is certainly an approach. And he's he's correct that there is uh, a lot of 
or there are a lot of companies out there that have a hard fence between inventors and the patent process because of a fear of treble damages. And what they do is, is they keep the inventors, engineers, and scientists away from the legal team, and they keep them away from reading prior art. And at times they have been told they're not allowed to read patents specifically. And in some cases it's even punishable um, because of this fear of treble damages. So the question is, do you have any comments that could help shift that attitude? Now I have some thoughts, but I know John does as well. So I'll, John, I'll kick it to you first. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, a, philosoph a philosophical difference that I noticed uh, a divide really in the 80s and 90s when I was getting underway um, in this business. And, and the divide uh, that I saw at the time was between the United States and Japan and Germany. These and, the, you know, I work in the automotive space, and so this was where uh, most of my work was coming from at that point. And the Germans and the Japanese relied on uh, patent disclosures first and foremost to tell them what they ought to be thinking about, what others were thinking about, and looking for the gaps in between and different approaches. And <clears throat> just one technology in particular, which <laughs> some of you may remember or have forgotten by now, is a four wheel steering. There was a, a time there when everybody thought that the way to dynamically fix uh, how a car handled would be to make the rear wheels steer as well as the front and so forth. <clears throat> and this was especially for lane change and, you know, moose avoidance and stuff like that. You may uh, remember the moose test uh, and the smart car that turned on its side every time. Well, four wheel steering can help address that. And so each Japanese company, Honda, Mazda, uh, Toyota and Nissan all developed their own approach to four-wheel steering, and it was entirely based on what others are doing, what was being revealed in published applications, and so forth. It, but Americans just don't regard patents the same way, didn't then, and, and didn't want their approach contaminated. And in my view, that's like uh, trying to work in the kitchen with a blindfold. You know, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're working with no information. The whole point of patent disclosures is so that you don't have to reinvent or rediscover the error that others have made. And this American shunning, you know, of patents as a source of inspiration or technology had reached its zenith in the dot-com uh, era of the early 2000s and mid-2000s where you know, you, you didn't want your engineers and, and so forth anywhere near patents for fear of, of treble damages and all that sort of stuff. Well, again, that's like working with a blindfold. Surely, uh, if you want to avoid something, wouldn't it be nice to know what it is, who's working on it, how they did it? So then you can have better information to avoid. It seems to me that, uh, you know, you're setting up uh, awfulness down the road where you didn't make an inquiry to determine what others were doing and purposely fell into what they did. Uh, you know, information, I think, is uh, makes for a more informed decision so that you can dodge what others are doing, uh, be inspired, take a different approach, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you're right. There's a hard philosoph philosophical difference out there. So my take on this is simply... Um, the federal circuit has so limited the amount of damages that can be awarded for patent infringement, even if there is infringement. Um, and getting lost profits is virtually impossible. So you're looking at reasonable royalty and a reasonable royalty is be, has become what it would have been had it been a fair negotiation prior to infringement a decade before the damages verdict was decided. So at the conclusion of patent litigation, damages today bear absolutely no relationship to what is fair or reasonable given the harm that has befallen the patent owner. Because the harm that is usually befallen the patent owner today in a case that is litigated for years and goes all the way to conclusion and then usually almost inevitably to appeal at the federal circuit is going to be in the hundreds of millions of dollars likely um, maybe even the billions of dollars at times and the federal circuit is just not going to allow anybody to have a billion dollar verdict and they're probably not even going to allow anybody to have 
hundreds of millions of dollars in a verdict before they're going to start reducing it. Uh, we saw them, you know, reduce and chip away at the at Apple's verdict. I mean, Apple's patent portfolio turns out to be worth very little, um, and it was their design patents that were the most valuable. Um, so anybody that really is engaging in a strategy based on a fear of damages, I think has not been paying attention to the law and is doing themselves a tremendous disservice because they're wasting their budget simply they're wasting their patent budget because that means they're applying for patents on things they have no idea whether or not they're new so if they want to do that that's fine but the companies that john and i are working with that are led by inventors who bring people like us in to teach them um how to do it right are gonna eventually win the day particularly as if as this patent pendulum starts to shift um and whether or not the companies in Silicon Valley are ever really going to get that message, I, I don't really know. But um, now we have another question, a very good one, uh, and one that just came up the other day when we were teaching uh, in uh, Minneapolis, John. We were, uh, a patent liaison came up to me with this very same question. It's how can patent attorney fulfill the obligation to disclose relevant prior art if um, engineers and scientists are doing their own search. Now, it kind of depends. I mean, in that situation, the question that I got was the engineers and scientists, what they were doing is they were running their own searches and they were, rather than weeding through them, they were sending three, 400 references, whichever the feed out came up with and sending them to the attorney and saying, here is the relevant prior art. Well, if the engineer scientist is going to send you hundreds of documents and characterize all of them as relevant, well, then you, I think, as the patent attorney, you're going to have to turn all of them over. So, again, it boils down to the culture of the company. Is the inventor scientist going to wind up being a partner or are they going to wind up being uh, playing harassing defense, I guess is the way to say it. Because if they're going to wind up playing harassing defense, then you as the patent attorney are only going to be able to do as much as you can do with the budget the client is going to provide. So one of the other reasons that that we were brought into this one company, and they were very specific about it, is look, we want to pay our patent attorneys less. We want our scientists and engineers who know the invention better to do more, to participate more. And, and they see that as a way that they can then patent more and then if they patent more and they're getting more licensing revenue out of what they're doing and the more value, they can hire more scientists and researchers to do more and more. And that's, in fact, exactly what they are doing. Actually, I meant to tell you, John, I just saw they are now hiring again. They put a job posting. So whatever if they're doing, if they're doing it wrong, they're growing at a, a remarkable rate. Yeah. OK, so if they're doing it wrong, uh, I don't know what the right way to do it is. Uh, so um, I don't know. Do you have any more thoughts on that? Uh, well, just with respect to relevance, uh, that uh, it, it, depending on the technology you're in, because the, where I see the the hundreds of references show up are in the life science area and and maybe the pharma area, but especially life sciences where you have a lot of PhDs and their notion of relevance uh, it, it, with respect to publications and stuff like that is broader than relevance uh, with respect to what the patent office wants to see. And I, I feel sorry for the uh, everybody involved when I see these life science patents pop out and there's, you know, two, 300 references listed on the first few pages that nobody has really looked at, including the examiner, uh -huh. <laughs> because there's just no time to look it's at all that right. stuff. It's too much. And so, you know, part of the process of engaging your inventors is to help them understand, look, if this would make for a good rejection, then you can either hand it to the PTO or change the claim. D don't forget that other solution is to change the claim. The other requirement for relevance is, does it tend to undermine a position you've taken at the patent office? And again, uh, you know, that's something you can talk to, to the in, inventor about. You know, where you've seen the office actions, the arguments, the replies. Uh, anything out there that would tend to be relevant on that uh, scale. It's not, um, you know, whatever you found, whenever you found it, turn it in. 
that's not helpful to anybody. Doesn't create a better patent. It just slows things down and and makes a mess uh, of the file history. So we also have somebody that mentions that if you do have the inventors doing that quick and dirty search, they may wind up doing inadvisable filtering of their inventions that they could submit and could be patented. And that is certainly absolutely true. And I think we probably all know as patent practitioners that one of the real fears is that inventors don't understand what could wind up being patented. So whenever you go to a client and you do the walkthrough, if you have a client that allows you to do that, you meet with them once a year or, or twice a year, whatever it may be, you see all kinds of stuff going on around there that could be protected. And again, it comes down to a, a cultural thing. You know, I have a particular client in mind that I went and visited. And frankly, I don't even know why they had me come and visit because I am like, you know, that can be patented. No, nah, we're not interested in it. Well, that could be protected. Well, nah, not interested in that. Well, I mean, why did you bring me here then? I mean, what, what is my role here today? Is it just to tell you what you can protect and then you're not going to protect anything? Because that actually wound up being the outcome. They didn't want to protect anything. And it's like, okay, well, thanks for paying my travel, I suppose. You know, it was, it was odd. So it turns out to be a philosophical thing, but if you can only, again, the old saying, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make the horse drink it. So I think, again, in the AIA world, you, you have to be giving best practices advice. And then if the client doesn't take it, they don't take it. But if you're not giving best practices advice and, and telling them, look, I need to be me meeting and talking to your inventors once a year, uh, advising them, I want to talk to the new hires in a group, we could do a Skype meeting, whatever the case may be, um, to educate them or you need to be doing this and stuff because eventually we're going to see malpractice cases. We're going to see ethical issues from the AIA because people are going to lose based on somebody filing a day or two or a week earlier and it's going to be hard and fast. John? Uh, yeah, I mean, you are uh, the patent world to the folks that you speak to. And so what you say will be relied on, it will be inspiring and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, you ought to uh, ask, can I come in once a year and just speak to all your new hires within the last year, all your engineering and, and people that might invent? Because they need to have it explained to them that the company has a future to the extent they create it. You know, it. they may think, yeah, man, I've landed the big job. Yeah, the big job lasts because you are here creating that prospect. It's not automatic. You know, how many companies, uh, and we can sit around and name all of them, uh, that don't have a future, didn't have a future because they were unable to participate in the future that that came about. And, you know, in the tech area, you, you can just tick off, uh, you know, half dozen names and you go, wow, remember when they were all that? Yeah. Well, something happened. They didn't uh, latch on to the fact that they had to help uh, create the future. And so it's a philosophical thing. And no, you don't need to patent everything, but uh, patent a lot of stuff, you know, the stuff that matters, the stuff that will create uh, that opportunity for the company in the future. And and this, you know, and Gene and I keep coming back to this example, the company that, that brought us in. Um, it was to uh, solidify and make more patent savvy their uh, abilities in this area. And I, I've been brought in, you know, at C-level things, you know, for uh, directors and, and so forth at a company, all the all the, the high-level people to get them to understand that the role patents can play uh, in their business objectives, the, you know, the, the strategic aspects uh, and, and what what how they can be used against them, you know, just more patent savvy. That's, that's really what you're aiming for. And, you know, to circle back, searching helps that and knowledge of patents helps that. So I would encourage people to regard patents as a, a wonderful archive and resource. Okay. So we got a few questions that maybe we can pick off in the last couple minutes before we will wrap. Um, and th this is, let's see, some people use a, a practice where they follow provisional and force a restriction during conversion. Um, 
is there an advantage to that approach? Is there an advantage to forcing the restriction, John? Just generally, it doesn't even, I, I mean, you can do that, I suppose, even without filing as a provisional, but um, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, it depends on the technology and the design area, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, force the restriction. The reason is, when you file that divisional, you already have a concession or at least a statement from the PTO that this is distinct and separately patentable, but it doesn't count against term and it extends the effective uh, protection. But in regular utility applications and plant applications, but for the most part, utility applications, you know, if you file and you get a restriction and then you file a divisional, remember term is ticking already from your earliest non-provisional filing date. So yes, there may be some advantage to forcing a provisional to a, a restriction rather to avoid uh, double patenting rejections, but you know, do you want to give up that much term while you wait for that issue to ripen? So in the design area, yep, force uh, the uh, restriction, a wonderful thing in uh, regular non-provisional utility applications. Uh, the term implications may overcome uh, wanting to force that restriction. Okay, so Mike, we have a uh, a question for for you. I think here, it goes: um, How would you go about conducting a patent search? Uh, presumably, this is a, a using the to total one um, that you were discussing. Um, if the client just wanted to skip the provisional. So I think what this is getting at is, is uh, how would you go about use, doing a more deep dive search? Because I think when we were going through your slides, we were talking about for the purpose of kind of doing a, a once over lightly so that uh, we could get a good feel before we filed the provisional. So how would you do a more detailed search? Yeah, so for, for a more detailed search, what I would do is instead of, searching, for example, on, you know, uh, one data point, maybe just looking at a class quickly, uh, would be to think out a search strategy and a query. Uh, and um, the, the tool uses Boolean search logic. So you can, you've got proximity operators and an or operators. Um, you've got 107 different authorities you can run it against. So I would in that case, and we also have stemming uh, in there, so it will, it will find variants of your search terms. So in a case like that, I would be looking um, to spend a little more time sitting down, uh, teasing out, okay, from a, from a search perspective, how would I want to do a deeper search on this and construct a query that would reflect that? And that's something that I would do is, is and that's probably something where you're going to want to go uh, if it's, you know, if you're in a law firm or if you're in a corporate legal department to either, if you have a search specialist that's there, maybe a patent agent uh, that does a lot of searching, uh, an information professional that their job is to do the more complex searches or farm it out to a search firm uh, to do it for you and give you the results back. That's, if you're going to do that deeper sort of dive, if you're if you don't have a high confidence level in your own searching skills, then I would look for someone in the office who that is one of their main activities and have them conduct it for you after you give them an idea of what it is that you want to have searched. Because there is, um, I I personally think there's there's an advantage um, when it comes to searching to having those skills or utilizing somebody who has a lot of experience in constructing complex queries to get at what you're looking for. There, there's, there's definitely an art to doing that. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. So John, we have one, I think, let's try and fit this really quickly in if we can, the last question. Can you use multiple provisionals within the 12 month Paris convention date? Um, I've heard recently that PCT can only relate back to one priority under the PCT priority rules. Uh, yeah, Paris Convention priority is the basis of PCT priority, and so you can have multiple provisionals. It's just not particularly common when you uh, file the PCT to claim priority to more than one provisional, but there's certainly no rule against it. But 
uh, the problem in the PCT scenario vis-a-vis -vis, uh, a regular national U.S. filing is the following. With respect to a national U.S. filing, you can file a provisional, file a provisional, file a provisional, file a provisional, and this can t span, let's say you're in tech transfer, this can span over three years, and then you say, okay, I want to file a, a non-provisional, and then somebody mentions, well, do you guys want to... Um, do you guys want to uh, file a, a PCT? Ah, problem. Whereas you can file a U.S. national application and simply take advantage of any um, uh, provisional filed within the last year, not so for the PCT. Paris Convention priority requires that you file within a year of the earliest priority document. And so uh, understand that very important distinction that, yeah, PCTs can take advantage of more than one provisional, but they all have to be within a year. If you've got one <clears throat> sticking out there beyond a year, you forfeit it all priority because it, it operates just like um, Paris Convention priority. That one year, it's, it's one and done. You start with your original one. So uh, sure, PCTs can take advantage of more than one provisional, but they all have to be within a year, and you can't have one on the other side of that year like you can for, uh, for a U.S. regular national filing. Okay, well, thank you guys. I really appreciate you participating here. I know we're at the one o'clock hour and we've started to lose some folks who are probably beyond their lunch time. But what I'd like to do is in very rapid fire succession, give each of you an opportunity to give those who are with us uh, the one thing you hope that they will leave remembering. Mike, let's start with you. What one thing do you want people to remember from today? Um, it, it, I, how I would kind of, a little bit pithy, but how I would kind of encapsulate this is that um, uh, intentional ignorance is never a good strategy. Um, so you use the abilities that are out there for doing searching to understand the landscape. Oh, that's great. I love that. Intentional ignorance. I may, I may use that. Uh, thanks, Mike. <laughs> John, your sure. final thought. Yeah, that was, that was a great one. I'd like to adopt that purposeful ignorance. Just don't do it. But so, uh, yeah, the, the thing that I'd leave you with is what I began with speed. Uh, speed matters. And the earlier the filing date, the better, because it may be the only thing that you have uh, to get ahead of anybody else. It's all about that filing date. And by the way, this is across the globe now. You know, it, it's a level playing field for you to race to any patent office anywhere. So um, your target is sufficiency of disclosure, uh, making it read well and good claims and all that can come later. Uh, but make sure you have, you know, you get there the firstest with the mostest, uh, to borrow a quote from uh, that, that uh, excellent philosopher, right? Uh, Yogi Berra? Is that Yogi Berra? <laughs> no, that's Bubba Gump. Oh, all right. Uh, Bubba Gump, Tom Hanks. It's, it's sort of a Yogi Berra kind yeah. of character. All right. Well, thank you all. Uh, I thought today's discussion was was excellent. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, John. Thank you, LexisNexis. It's been a long time. Very good partner. So if you do need any of their services, and I don't know how you could operate in our space and not need at least some of LexisNexis IP services, but if you if you need any of their services, please give them a test drive and check them out. They are they're great. I do use their services and I, and I like them a lot. Uh, so thank you, LexisNexis. So hopefully you'll join us on another webinar and we will see you soon. Have a great weekend. Happy holiday, everybody in America, at least. Enjoy Memorial Day.